Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Your host, Jeff Lerner, back with you. Excited, as always, to be probing the minds of the world's top achievers and some of the most successful people on this planet to really figure out what makes them tick and what it takes so that we can all try to tick in our unique variation of the same way to get these amazing results that we see people left and right having. So we know they're out there. How do we go get them for ourselves? Today, I am joined by Peter Sage, a pretty amazing, prolific entrepreneur. It took me a good chunk of time just to read through all of his accomplishments. I'll try to sum up a few of them. Um, he's the founder of a number of multi-million dollar companies, the Energy Fitness Group, Worldwide Health Corporation, Space Energy, Sage Business School, does a ton of teaching, sits on the board of academic institutions. He's a six-time TEDx speaker. Um, he's an accomplished athlete, marathon runner, author, speaker, consultant to some of the Smartest and most successful people in the world. Peter, I, we'd be here all hour if I just keep reading, kept reading this list. So I'm going to stop there. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks for being here. Hey, well, an absolute pleasure, Jeff. No, absolutely. And it's always you know, somewhat humbling when I, I hear people do an introduction. But I think one of the first things I like to remind people that are listening is that, you know, we're, we're all made of the same stuff. You know, I'm, I'm just somebody else out of the chair. You know, and mm-hmm. as soon as you realize that, you know, we all put our, our pants on one leg at a time, and uh, we, we can equal the game a little bit and not get too far ahead of ourselves. And that keeps me humble. Yeah, you know, it's in my audience, they're all, they're probably like, oh, I'll bet Jeff's about to tell that story about that first event that he went to because they all know my stories. But it reminds me of this, the, the first like success, business, entrepreneurial, personal and professional growth event that I ever went to. And there was this group of like the top people. They'd all been on stage. They were, you know, multi-gazillionaires really accomplished speakers and and they're all standing in this group after the you know on a break talking and I wanted to walk up to them but I was intimidated I was like oh they're too good and I'm too small and and not good and and then I realized wait a minute I'm taller than all of them (laughs) like I'm six feet tall I'm not like a giant but they were all you know they were like five nine five ten I was like wait I'm physically they all look like giants to me on stage but it's like, no, these are just real people. In fact, I even got an inch on most of them. So it was, it was that, that revelation in the moment of like, Jeff, e- either take them off the pedestal or stop selling yourself short. Like we're all just human, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so anyway, that said, Mr. Human, you have done quite a few pretty cool things uh, that are not what we would consider average or the norm. Um, why don't you take us back? The, the question that I always like to really get to the root of, because I think it's, if we can answer this question, it's the most useful thing for everyone else to understand, is like, what, what do you think is the original spark or seed or whatever that gave you the, the fortitude, or, or maybe I'll let you define whatever it is, like, what does it take to achieve at the level you've achieved? And also, like, how did you get it? Do you have any insight there? Yes, and yeah, very, very great question. And thinking back, there's, there's several components to that, which I think would be useful for the people you know, listening or watching. And, and that is as follows. I mean, I, I had some revelations when I was at school. I wasn't very academically gifted. You know, I'm still not. You know, I'm not a smart guy when it comes to being book smart. You know, I couldn't spell MBA. You know, I, I, was, I, was, I was out of school at 16 like a rat up a drain pipe. Yeah, I, it was huh. never going to be further education. So I dropped out of high school and uh, essentially never went to college, never suffered the disadvantage of a, a university education. And uh, uh, when uh, I realized something very unique, and that is that 
by the very definition of getting a job, I would always be settling for less than what I was worth. Even if it was a very high paid job, let's say it was a thousand bucks a week. And you know, we're going back to you know, late eighties here. So you know, let's just say that was off the charts, you know, top lawyers and CEOs of big companies were earning that kind of money. But I was thinking, hang on, if I'm employed and I'm being paid a hundred bucks a week, a thousand bucks a week, it's the job itself has to be worth more. Otherwise there's nothing in it for the business. Owner. Right. So the very definition of me going to work would mean I'd be settling for less than what I was worth. And that, that struck a chord in me. I'm like, no, why? You know, if I saw someone drive a Ferrari, I'd get excited that it was possible to earn enough money to get a Ferrari because somebody had done it. And if somebody could do it, I knew I could too. And that was really the impetus for me quitting school. Uh, I did a couple of little jobs to start with. In fact, I ended up working for my dad for a few months. Uh, he, he owned his own job. He had a, a breaker's yard, a junkyard. And I was being paid 40 bucks a week, yeah, classic child labor for family businesses. And I remember turning around to my dad, Jeff, and saying, I I'm going to leave at the end of the week. He said, what are you getting into, son? And I said, well, I'll be honest, I have no idea. But I have a belief, and I still have that belief. And the belief is if you jump in the deep end, you can only swim. And people aren't fragile. Yeah, as you'll hear many people say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I, I quit, and I had my last 40 pounds that he paid me, which is about 50 US dollars. And I paid my mom 10 bucks. I paid my friend 10 bucks. I owed him. I got my last 20 bucks in my hand. And I thought, what do I do now? And I went to a, a toy wholesaler that was renowned for very strictly you know, trade only, I walked in as if I owned the place. You know, I didn't have any you know, resources in terms of capital, but I had personal power. Yeah, I know, and I walked in and I basically told them that I was a big successful market trader, that I specialized in toys, and, and I was essentially telling the truth in advance. Right. And um, I got the trade card, I, bought my, I, I spent 15 pounds on the toys out of my last 20, and I went to a flea market that weekend and I sold my 15 pounds. I, I paid my last five pounds to, to stand on the flea market. And I pay, I, I basically, that was it, that's all I had. I couldn't have a little table to put my toys on because I, it wouldn't fit in the little car that my dad had let me out of the junkyard. Uh, and I put a blanket on the floor and I sold my 15 pounds with the toys for 30 pounds, I doubled up. And I went back the next week and I bought you know, 25 pounds with the toys. I used five pounds to get on the, the flea market and I sold a lot for 50 pounds. Over six, seven weeks, I built up enough to start doing market stalls and then Sunday markets and toy parties. And I was 17 years old, and my catchphrase was Pete the Toy Boy. And it kind of went from there. I, I remember that it was, I left my dad in June, and by October, I'd made my first thousand. And what was so special for me, Jeff, was that I'd made it, I'd not earned it. And at that point, I had another belief click in, which is you can never take my toolbox away. I'll always be able to do something like that. And that was the, the, the seed of the entrepreneurship. And again, 31 years later, yeah, I'm 27 international companies, yeah, some of which have been majestic failures, some of which have done excellent, some should have stayed ideas when I was drunk, yeah, <laughs> and, and pretty much everything in between. It's been quite a wild ride. Well, so first of all, I have to say, I'm glad that you acquired the nickname of Pete the Toy Boy and not Pete the the boy toy. <laughs> Those would have been two <laughs> radically different futures for your life. Yeah, well, to be fair, in England, toy boy in England means the same as boy toy in the US. Oh, that's, why was, that's why it was there. So, yeah. I'm, wow. uh, okay. I, it wouldn't work anymore. I, it, today, it would be Pete the Sugar Daddy, but I'd probably have to start a bakery for that one to work. I don't know. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, I, love, I love the way you talked about um, jobs. And, and I, you know, it's funny, man, with what, with what I do and I imagine what you do, there's kind of this almost like delicate delicacy around the handling of the concept of a job. Like some people in my space, the entrepreneurial education space, they're super almost belligerently anti-job. And I try not to come too hard at people. I just try to like help them see what you just said, which is the truth. And that that's fine for a time. I mean, you had to work for your dad's scrapyard to get the first 40 bucks, right? I mean, like, it's fine, but it's not, a, it's, I don't see the job as like a really viable long-term plan based on the outcome that most people, all things being equal, would say they want for their life. Most people want a pot of gold at the end of their rainbow that 
unfortunately isn't consistent with what you get for working a job for 40 years. And I just don't see most of the world really being aware of that. Um, and I should, I should say, I don't know, Pete, if you can hear me, but the screen's totally frozen on my end. So maybe, I, maybe you I'm can good. Hear me. Whereas as a business owner, because I actually teach that in business, it's still a good practice to not, to give more than you ask for in return. Like, if you want to make $1,000, go create $10,000 worth of value and only ask for $1,000 and everybody will feel like you did them a favor. But the difference with entrepreneurship is if you want to make twice as much, you can deliver twice as much value. You yeah. can't do that in a job. And right. unfortunately for most people, in order to get to where they want, which is a retirement with at least a few million bucks, so they can like buy their grandkids nice stuff on Christmas or take a vacation with their husband or wife or be able to afford the prescriptions that insurance doesn't cover or like whatever befalls older people, the job's not going to tee them up for that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, me personally, I have been certified unemployable for 31 years and that'll, that'll never change. However, when you look at kind of apples for apples, really one has to understand what is the psychology that's going on because what people are really doing when it comes to a job is that they are trading fulfillment for certainty. Yeah. And unfortunately, no amount of intellectualizing and explaining and demonstrating and proving that that isn't a great strategy to retire in any kind of shape financially, let alone emotionally, spiritually, or otherwise, is ever going to get past that level of fear. Because just like in a lot of relationships, and I hate to say this, is actually more predominant women than men, unfortunately. Most, most again, would rather stay certain in a relationship that is loveless than risk uncertainty and go for fulfillment. Yeah. And you know, if you can understand, and I get asked a lot of the time, what is the defining characteristic of an entrepreneur? Yeah. And you have, you have many, everyone wants the one secret, you know, if you've got everything from desire, persistence, willingness to learn as we spoke earlier before the show. But if I was to nail it down into one thing, it would be the ability to handle uncertainty. Now, when you strip that away, you understand it exposes the illusion that there is no such thing as certainty, as many people this year have found out. Yeah. Uh, so your ability to accept the fact that you're never going to have certainty and everybody can put their hand up to having something they thought was a dead cert, a relationship, a job, health, whatever it may be, only to have that blanket pulled away in a heartbeat. You see, the difference is the tree doesn't stand there worrying if it's going to get blown down by a storm tomorrow. See, there's no certainty in nature. There's no certainty in life. Now, if you want to see that magnified, look at business. Because business, as you and I know, we're the last people to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah I, I've got yeah, dozens of staff in my current company, and we've got tens of thousands of, of dollars a month in overhead. And you know, I'm the one that, you know, it, my dogs eat before me. Right? right? So yeah, I have to embrace that level of uncertainty. But for me, I've got a different relationship to it. For me, it's part of the game. I'm swinging the bat because... I'm not confusing or tying my self-worth to my net worth. Yeah. And that's what stops a lot of people because if you mistakenly you know, tie your self-worth and net worth together, when your sense of net worth is threatened or you have to risk something that could end up in lower money rather than more money, it has a knock-on effect to the potential of your self-worth and therefore it triggers the primary fear that all human beings have which is the fear we're not enough. Yeah. And most people would do almost anything to avoid that, including saying a job that they know is not going to help them when they retire. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like sitting here taking a beat with what you just said, because that's so it, man. It's so it. I, you know, for two years now, I've been in the full time, day in, day out, literally minute by minute life experience of, trying to breathe life and energy and strategy into what I believe is the actual highest certainty uh, strategy for creating a really exemplary outcome in life, which is entrepreneurship. Because I think that when you cast off the illusion of certainty, you can chase actual, maybe not certainty, but at least actual probability. Where if you, know, you look at the world we're in now, the probability of you working a job for 40 years and retiring in a place where you're comfortable, you can take care of your family, you could help the grandkids if one of your kids hits a speed bump, 
your house is paid off. You can take a trip. You can play a little golf. You can do all this stuff. You can enjoy the gratification that you delayed for the 40 years. The probable, the higher probability there is to start your own business. And yet I am constantly like, it's maddening that I am battling this, this conventional wisdom tsunami of misinformation and false certainty that look, if the outcome wasn't so, or if the, if the price tag wasn't so tragic, it would be laughable. Yeah. But it's not laughable, it's tragic because you have hundreds of millions, if not billions of people that are heading down a road that doesn't go where they were told it goes. 100%, and I think the world is slowly starting to wake up. I mean, when, when you look at traditional education, it does an amazing job of what it was designed for. Yeah. You go back to the pre-industrial revolution when we had a feudal-based system, and then we brought in the industrial revolution. And now what we needed to do is take people out of the fields and train them to show up on time, behave, not question authority, do not have any creativity, do not pull that lever because you think you're curious as to what it does because people will get hurt. Right. right? And that had a role to play. And then, you know, the Germans took the model on. We sort of expanded it across the Western world, et cetera. And, you know, because previous to that, education was always the mainstay of the political elite, the chosen scholars, the you know, royal families. Yeah, the, most of the world was not educated. 150 years ago, 2% of the world could read or write. So when this level of education started having to train the masses, they were trained in a, a sense of non-creativity, conformity, sh you know, show up, sit down, do as you're told, don't question. And that's what kind of moved us through into the early part of the 20th century, which for that particular period was useful right. and is completely disastrous to any kind of plan for fulfillment moving forward in today's world that has any kind of link to financial success or security. Right? And the, the challenge, Jeff, is this, that, yeah, as you said, the ultimate job security is entrepreneurship because other than that, the only job security you have is for your boss's ability to drive his or her company to success. Right. That's, yeah, you know, that's not the odds I want. It's a skills-based security. Like if you have the skills, you know, you talked about it, they can never take your toolbox. Those tools are utilizable and valuable in any country at any time on planet Earth, especially because one of those skills is the ability to learn and adapt so that if you're missing a tool, you'll acquire it. There has never been a time in human history where so much opportunity has been delivered with such a low barrier to entry. I mean, when I started some of my first bigger companies, you would need a million dollars of CapEx, yeah, capital expenditure to go in and build an infrastructure that today you can get for $6.99 a month on an app. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, know, you can run an international company from a smartphone at the stoplights. It's, it, there has never been a time where the, the bar is so low and you don't have to compete with multi-zillion dollar budgets of corporations anymore, uh, you can start an international company with a, an iPhone and, and yeah, a couple of apps and get going and a little bit of intelligence. Yeah, the information's free these days. I mean, the Harvard syllabus is on Google, for goodness sake. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you, you know, there's no excuse unless you are locked into the false paradigm, which is essentially trying to chug you along uh, and feed you yeah, pieces of crack certainty so that you can stay addicted to living under your potential. And unfortunately, as much as it frustrates you trying to bang that into somebody's awareness, we don't have the right to get people to star in a different movie. Mm -hmm. Our only ability is to be the example and the invitation. Because what I've learned in 30 years of doing what I do and understanding human behavior and, and high-level coaching at every level is that the number one law of personal coaching is that if you want something for somebody more than they want it for themselves, you are wasting your downtime. Yeah. And when you correlate that with the number one law, in my opinion, of personal growth, is that people will never rise above the opinion of themselves. Mm. So you start tackling that level, you start inspiring people, you start holding up a mirror for their own greatness, and you start giving some positive level of reinforcement and starting to pull some of the limiting beliefs by their infrastructure through inference or help, and now they are free to start yeah, loosening the lock on that entrepreneurial door that they've slammed shut because there's a big scary monster behind it and they don't realize it's, it's Nirvana. Yeah, they, they don't realize that the, the job fox is guarding the entrepreneur hen house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you, know, you mentioned school. I, 
It's so funny, man. I, in my journey of content creation, you know, I have this YouTube channel and we're up to like th over 13,000 subscribers. Like it's starting to get traction. I've been doing it. I've been working hard on it for like two years, but when, oh. but in order to get traction with it, I have to, you know, play the marketer's game of like, what do people want? And then make the videos that people want to watch. Right. I used to just make the videos that I thought were interesting and nobody wanted to see them. But one of the videos I, one of the videos I did was like an hour and a half exploration of the history of Western education. Exactly what you just said about how we, you know, initially the schools were organized to teach people behavior patterns that would allow them to translate into factories. That's why we have bells. That's why we have really tightly clocked shifts. They clock, you notice schools are still one of the only places that doesn't tend to operate around a half hour, quarter hour, hour framework. Like my daughter's always like, oh, it's, it's 9.58. If I was in school today, my, my math class would have just gotten out. I'm like, they let your class out at 9.58? Why don't they just let it out at 10 o'clock? It's because factories are su such finely tuned machines, they run on like four, six, eight, 17, 24 minute increments of time. And so they're like, they're literally still training people to think like a factory. And then you learn about what the way, uh, the way religion played into it, how when the Catholic wave, this is a US thing, but when the Catholic wave of immigration, there was the, the, the famine in Ireland, and, uh, and then also in Southern Europe, you, you had a lot of Italians and Greeks and then Irish, a lot of Catholics immigrating into the United States. The Protestants all started freaking out and were like, oh my gosh, these Catholics are going to overrun the schools and we're going to lose our Protestant, you know, mental stronghold. So we need to lobby the government to create standards in, ed in education. And that's why all of a sudden you had things like the Lord's Prayer being said every day in school. And some other things that have only recently gotten kind of ripped away through, through cultural change because the, it was about the Protestants locking the schools into keeping people Protestant so they wouldn't be overrun by Catholics. That's why the Catholics all started their own schools. That's why you have the parochial school system in the United States where Catholics go to Catholic schools and yeah. not government schools. It's like, and yet here we are in the 21st century and you get it. I get it. It didn't take a whole lot of research to learn this stuff. Like you said, it's free on the internet. You watch my video on YouTube and in 90 minutes know more about education than most of the teachers in the world. To your point though, why, is it, why do we have to work so hard to get people to look at this differently? I mean, I, you said you can't want it more for them than they want it for themselves. You can't have a higher opinion of themselves than they do for themselves. But to me, that still doesn't even explain it. Why are people's eyes so willfully blind to these truths? There, there are a lot of hidden limiting beliefs that people have based upon childhood. There are a lot of indoctrinated beliefs that people have they're not even aware of. Again, like tying their self-worth and their net worth together, for example. There's a lot of power around the whole concept of identity. If you don't see yourself as an entrepreneur, if you see yourself as an employee who wants to be an entrepreneur, then guess what? You're never going to find the opportunities because right. employees don't attract or see or spot through their reticular activating system the opportunities that are circling them all the time. If you see yourself as an entrepreneur who's currently as a, you know, uh, on an uh, undercover mission as a you know, secret employee, uh, you know, uh, right, right. where you, you're, you're basically grateful to an employer for just you know, paying for some apprenticeship while you prepare yourself for the destiny of starting captain in your own ship. You're going to have a different energetic relationship to possibility, to uh, the probability of meeting people that you will be open to uh, opportunities for, all of that stuff. But many people don't do it because they have the wrong identity. They've never questioned it. It's just what I do. It's just who I am. Well, no, that's, that's every identity is put on with Velcro, uh, not super yeah. glue. So yeah, I am full stop is the only identity that once you're comfortable with that, you can choose what comes after it. But people that yeah, work on, oh, I am, yeah, uh, uh, I'm an employee, I'm, yeah, and most people don't like the identity they have, so now they're resisting it. And one thing I've found consistently is that yeah, complaining about your current circumstances is the glue that keeps you tied to them. Ooh. And so yeah, yeah, your, your energetic relationship to that is a case of, I'll give you an art gallery metaphor that I often use. If you're walking into an art gallery, you're a guest. 
and you walk into one room, and let's say it's Picasso. You don't like Picasso. In fact, you find his work offensive. And so you demand to see the curator and have him remove the pictures. Well, you've got no right to do that. Yeah, the only thing you're going to get is security to throw you out. Right. Regardless of the fact you bought a ticket. But you have every right to walk into a different room, Van Gogh or what have you, or Monet, and admire something different. Now, what most people are doing, they're in the art gallery of their life, complaining of the artwork that's on their wall. Yeah, look at that horrendous bank statement. Look at that credit card debt. Look at my boss. Look at... And guess what? Yeah, you've got no right to change any of that. You've got every right to choose to walk into a different room. Mm -hmm. And when you can unhook from that, yeah, you have a whole different sense of possibility open up. But we don't learn this in school. As you no. say, you know, we, well, we yeah, know I mean, to, to complete the metaphor, I don't think a lot of people truly realize that there is actually another room in the another gallery. Room. It's not just it's this enjoy. crazy idea of another room that's in someone else's gallery that only millionaires are allowed to visit. It's like in your gallery too. Every, every, everyone who got to where they're at started from where they were. Case closed. Yeah. Right? No, nobody's really born. There's, there's, the, the vast, vast majority of millionaires and billionaires today in the 95 plus percent were born yeah, at a level close to zero. Yeah. yeah, we're not in old school elite money and, more anymore. And that's majority. a massive flip from the last 30 years, which I, I've read yeah. those studies too. Yeah, it's like it's a massive flip from human history. Yeah, exactly. The average yeah. millionaire now is self-made. The average billionaire now is self-made. Yeah, yeah 100%. So let, let me give a framework for people listening or watching here that may be useful to understand how to break the mindset because I go back to Einstein's question. Please. Einstein said that, yeah, you... Uh, or his phrase, sorry, where he said, you cannot solve a problem at the same level of thinking or consciousness that created the problem. Yeah. So trying to get somebody to intellectualize themselves or educate themselves out of their current situation with the same level of thinking is simply going to give them more tools to justify why they should be where they're at or why it's impossible to move forward. So when it comes to consciousness, most people don't have a framework for understanding it. Yeah, it's the... Yeah, on one side, you've got the, the scientists that try to reduce it to a byproduct of brain function, which it never has and never will be uh, because you know, the brain doesn't produce consciousness any more than a television produces programs. Right? And on the other side, you have kind of the, the new age, you know, sing come by our, you know, the divine ether basket where you know, people that are too right brain, you can't get a conceptual understanding of, of how to make it practical. Right. So I have a framework here that I think is it's short, it's easy, and, and it'll really help people understand how to climb the ladder of awareness to, to break out of the mode that most people find themselves trapped in as it relates to things like being stuck in a paradigm of you know, the art gallery, the wrong room, the job you don't want, all of that stuff. So uh, I, I take what one of my favorite authors, David Hawkins, wrote the seminal book, Power Versus Force, and he outlined a, a map of consciousness, 16 different levels. I'm not going to get into that. I chunk it into four to make it easy for people. So the lowest level of consciousness that we see, vast majority of the planet here, especially in 2020, is the level of what I call to me. Yeah, in other words, the, the mantra of that is, well, I would have the house, the job, the career, the, the money, the wife, the whatever, but you know, everything happens to me. It is the quintessential victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And we all know where that leads, that nowhere in life is victimhood rewarded at any level. You speak to the CIA on the studies they did for you know, criminals and perpetrators and, and, and victims. Every victim that a perp chose emanated the energy of victim. Mm. Right? So if you're standing on the edge of the river of life saying, hey, I think life owes me a living, and I'm expecting the first class ship to come in and give me a free ticket, then guess what? You're gonna get cold and lonely. Doesn't work that way. So you move out of to me, and if you wake up a little, you can move to the next level of consciousness, which is by me. Here's the domain of the entrepreneur. This is the achiever name, because the, the, the whole aspect here, Jeff, is that if I am gonna get the goals, if I am gonna start the business, if I am gonna get the life I wanna live and retire financially free, it's only gonna happen by me. Uh, and you go after it. And to get out of to me and to get into by me, what do you have to give up? What do you have to replace it with? The first thing you have to give up is blame. Blame doesn't work anywhere in the universe. Right? If you give up blame and you replace that with personal responsibility for everything in your life, otherwise you're back to victim, then you can move out of to me, poor me, uh, at me, 
are moving to buy me. And that's a really great leap that most people, that's, that's the domain of Tony Robbins. Yeah, I worked with Tony for 15 years as one of his experienced trainers yeah, around the world. And what Tony, his sweet spot is taking people out of yeah, sort of to me mode and getting them into buy me mode. Yeah, you believe in yourself, get a rocket up your ass, get, get out there, swing the bat, make it happen. But it's also pretty exhausting for a lot of people over time. Yeah. So the next level is the level of what I call through me. And through me is where life flows. It becomes more effortless. You have your synchronicities. Doors open more effortlessly. You're at the right place at the right time. See, if something happens once, it's an incident. If it happens twice, it's a coincidence. But if it happens more than twice, it's a pattern. Mm -hmm. And patterns are based on rules. And the non-physical world has rules that are just as scientific and mathematical as the physical rules that we now see. But to get out of by me and to get into through me, what do you got to do? Well, the first thing you've got to give up, and this is where a lot of entrepreneurs struggle, you've got to give up the need for control. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Now, I said the need for control, not control itself. And there's a higher level of awareness there. And when you give up the need for control and you replace that with yeah, trust, faith, knowing in something bigger than you. Mm -hmm. If you're out there to make a million dollars because it's all about you, your certainty, your insecurities, your, you want to buy a car to prove to your brother that you know, your dad was wrong about him being the more successful one or your business school teacher wrote you off and you want to drive by their house. Well, all of that stuff. Yeah, I played that game for many years. I, I was, as a young man, my first major business. You know, I bought my first Ferrari for cash at 25. Yeah, I, I, was, you know, I have 60 staff miserable as hell because all I was doing was trying to cover up the insecurities of a young man of not being good enough. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, when I started giving up the need for control and replacing it with trusting something big, what can I contribute? How can I give my gift? How can I help people? How can I add value? I started to move out of the by me into the through me. And that's where life becomes far more effortless because there is a huge difference, Jeff, so I'm sure you've seen with a life chasing success versus a life chasing fulfillment. And so many people I see spend their life trying to get to the top of success mountain and then they wanna jump off because what they thought was there isn't because the mantra is like, hey, I'm gonna give up and sacrifice a huge amount of my life so that hopefully I can arrive at one place in the future where you know, I, I've got all of this money. So I'm gonna sacrifice my health, sacrifice my relationships, miss my kids growing up so that I get to a place where, oh, I've got enough money now to pay for my divorce, to buy my kids loads of stuff so they love me again and hire a personal trainer to get my health back. I mean, right. that, that's not the game you want to play, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's, it's and, and through me, looks at it in a different way. Yeah, you don't want to be, my, my business mentor passed away last week. Now I've got three business mentors. And he sold his last company uh, seven years ago now for 3.6 billion in cash. I've known this guy 15 years, never known him earn less than a million dollars a day miserable, overweight, angry, dysfunctional relationships, and now officially one of the richest men in the graveyard. Hmm. Yeah? Not a life I want to live. Yeah. Yeah. But hiding a good behind business your mentor, business. not a not a good life mentor, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, that's that's the kind of the two extremes. You're either you know, scared of swinging the bat or you're so frantic to try to swing the bat to get on the scoreboard so you can prove to nobody else who cares. Yeah, what you, that you're good enough or, yeah, or be addicted to your story. And, and I'll share this one for the, for, for the listeners. Yeah, 80% of people don't care about your problems and the other 20% are glad you have them. So hiding behind victim mode ain't going to do it. So true, right? man. Yeah, so waking up to your own greatness, your potential, go swing the bat. You're not going to take it with you. Yeah, Errol didn't yeah, have a, a bank account on the other side, I can promise you. Yeah. And so... You know, being, waking up, getting out of victim mode and then getting into achiever mode is a great start. And if you're in achiever mode and you're getting tired and worn out and frustrated and, and you know, banging your head against the wall and missing the greatness of life, it's start to, or maybe time to chunk up a little and start focusing on more about you know, being able to play the game with a smile and give your gifts and win, lose, or draw. Go embrace this gift we have. Then you know, get on a grindstone until you fall off. You know, I think you, first of all, Thank you for articulating those, those stages by me or to me, by me and through me because A, you helped. And by the way, this podcast is a total like selfish project for me because I learn from amazing people like you that help me understand life and business and everything better. And I just had one of those moments when like 
even if we never publish this episode, I'm so grateful for that conversation because you just helped me understand something that I've been through in the last several years, which has basically been the transition from by me to through me. That in the two years since I said, hey, you know what? It is, it's tiring trying to prove to myself and the rest of the world how successful I am and how successful I'm gonna be, it's tiring. What if I just start trying to help other people be more successful? And by the way, I'm now way more successful than I was two years ago while, in, while having a lot more fun and, and, and stressing a lot less. Um, so thanks for sharing that. But the other thing uh, that I think is, it begs to be said in light of what you said is historically, you kind of had to go through a buy me phase right. in order to kick ass in this world. It was like, because of what you said, like it costs money to start a business. Like most businesses, you, you might need a million dollars in capital to start a business. So in order to get that million dollars, maybe you got to go get a job or you got to go apprentice with some successful guy and you got to prove to everyone how badass you are and you got to get all these promotions so you can get the capital to even go try to live a through me professional life. But the world we live in now, act, and I'm living proof of this, it actually rewards through me more than it rewards by me because it's all on display. It's all so transparent. It's all right on the, out, the open. And the tools now are so accessible and inexpensive. You don't have to go exhaust yourself doing with a by me phase anymore. You can literally go right to through me and use social media to get the word out. Yeah, and that. There's a certain level of time or time in the saddle on each level so that you have a, an emotional understanding, not an intellectual yeah. understanding of being able to be addicted to that. Because yeah, tools are just tools regardless of the level of consciousness you're at. What, what changes is you. Yeah, outer world follows inner world, not the other way around. You've got chaos in your, in your, your, your life, check your thinking. And yeah, from, from that side, yeah, it's, it, nobody's born in line. Buddha wasn't born in line. Yeah, he right. was born Prince Siddhartha. So yeah, you don't expect a, a three-year-old to go to college. Yeah, there, there's a there's a phase, and it's okay. Yeah, one of my beliefs is you can't run out of time and you can't get it wrong. Yeah, regardless of, of what movie you're currently in, and yeah, we, we all star in the movie of our life. Right. right? And, I, and I'm pretty certain of that because I think you know we're the only people that star in every scene of the movie of our life. So that's pretty unequivocal. But yeah, there's been many movies before. Yeah, there's going to be more movies. I don't care what your belief system is around it. Try to reconcile it in an empowering way. No one's really going to know in this game anyway, so why not pick something that serves you? You know, I don't believe that death is the opposite of, of life. I think it's the opposite of birth. And you know, what I'm going to take with me is my accumulated acting experience into the next movie. Right. I'm not going to remember the lines from this movie because it would confuse me in the next one. So that's cool. But you know, from from, from being able to try to raise my consciousness slash acting experience to be a slightly better person and put one foot in front of the other each day in a way that helps me lower fear, raise love, and essentially become the best version of myself that I can be in any given moment. That's really the reason we're here. We're in Earth School. We're not meant to get it right every time. If you get all the answers right in class, you're in the wrong class. Right. And you, don't get, you don't get better at tennis by playing people you can beat. But if you're beating yourself up because yeah, you got it wrong, you just simply failing to say, like in business, one of the best lessons I, or one of the shifts in awareness I made is understanding that my failures are my most yeah, valuable capital. Yeah, your best teacher is your last mistake. And if you start, especially from, we mentioned a little bit about the Catholicism, which yeah, tends to, to lean on this a lot about guilt and yeah, being able to drag around a, a ball and chain of beating yourself up. Nowhere is that ever going to pay you back in terms of lifting you up to be a better version to help more people. So, a, I, I couldn't agree more um, with what you just said. I, I have to ask, I mean, I, I appreciate the little bit of self-deprecation that you are, you're, you know, you're not the smartest guy around, but clearly you're a, you, you have worked very hard to evolve a pretty sophisticated uh, understanding and, and, and framework of consciousness and a, a, applied psychology, right? That's one of the things I noticed in, in most of the commentary about you is that your success is very rooted in behavioral psychology and, you know, kind of consciousness based approaches to building business and shaping people. Um, well played for a quote, not a smart guy, by the way, but how, how did, how did you kind of get into this? Because it's, it has a much more holistic feel than the typical business leader vernacular. 
appreciate that. And I think yeah, the, the, there is a big gap in the market for people that can't reconcile kind of business and yeah, sense of self, spirituality, purpose, and, and a mission to, to an extent. But for me, I, I remember when I was in my early time, I got into personal growth at 17. Okay. Yeah, so again, 31 years in the game. I, 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 I could be far less than smart. Uh, and not have been in the, the business for that long and not spot patterns. And one thing that Tony taught me 20 years ago, where he says, yeah, if you want to get good at helping people, get good at spotting patterns because there's only so many of them. And the one thing that started me on the quest here, Jeff, was that I remember I was at the gym one time, and, yeah, I just finished the workout. Health's one of my values. Yeah, I, I've, I've done some crazy stuff, as you've seen. And, yeah, I remember I was just finished the workout. I got a protein shake at the bar, and there's a guy come up to me, and we start chatting, and, Everyone wants to talk about their favorite subject, which is obviously themselves. Right. And usually everybody's favorite part of their favorite subject, which is why their life sucks. And I'm early 20s. I'm already very successful. You know, I'm driving supercars. I'm like, you know, I'm flying Concorde. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I've got my, got my shit together. So I thought, right. right? And yeah, again, all driven by insecurities. But I knew how to fix this guy's problem. Yeah, and of course, I got enthusiastic. I was giving him strategies on goal setting, extra income streams, you know, dealing with his ex relationship, all of this stuff. And because I'm excited, somebody else is excited. And I think I recommended him think and grow rich at the end of the conversation. He went off all on a high, and I felt proud I'd helped right. save somebody's life and change it, right? And it was three weeks later, I remember. I remember during that time, I, thought, I wonder what chapter he's on. I wonder if he's on a chapter of auto suggestion or getting to the part where there's the announced sixth sense or mastermind. And I saw him three weeks later, and I almost ran up to him and said, Hey, hey, Dave. How's, how's it going with the book? And he turned around and he said, oh, oh yeah, what was it called again? <laughs> and it was that moment, apart from feeling deflated that I wasted my time, that it opened up a door in my mind. You know, the great late Jim Rohn said that formal education may help you make a living, which you know, is already outdated and questionable. Right. Informal education you know, can help you make a fortune. And I took that to heart, but it opened up a, a gap for a, a challenge. And when I had, I had that conversation, I felt deflated. I'm like, why? Why is it that some people are so committed to keeping their problems rather than outgrowing them? And that's what set me off on this quest for understanding human behavior. And, and really looking at you know, the insecurities, the addiction to certainty, the self-worth, net worth issues, and, 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 and dozens of others I could, I could drill down into, and understanding consciousness in the way that that is primary. Yeah, there's a lot of emotional teenagers running around in very adult bodies, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and, so and when you wake up to understand the reality that life is not a comfort-centric experience, yeah, you've been sold the illusion of that through marketing stuff that makes your life easier, that we've never had before in humans. No, life is a growth-centric experience. And everything in nature teaches us that. Everything in nature grows and contributes or is taken out of the food chain. We just think we're different because we're watching TV commercials on yeah, how to do labor-saving stuff and feel good. But when you realize life is a growth-centric experience, it doesn't mean to say you can't be comfortable, but it's not the purpose. Right. The purpose is to grow, and you don't grow in a comfort zone. You don't turn around to an athlete and say, you know, what are you working on? Gold medal. Oh, brilliant. What, you, what else are you working on? How to make my workouts easier. Uh, that doesn't work. Right, right. right. If you're not throwing up in 30 minutes, you want your money back from your personal trainer. But it's yeah. not all the last burning rep. There's so many people in, in 2020 right now with what's been going on in the world have been looking at it through the mindset and the perspective of the muscle fiber. You know, there's weight on the bar and they're screaming to the brain, stop, I'm being broken down. This is horrible. Help. So, you know, so what are you doing? Whereas if you were to chunk up to the mindset of the athlete, you're proud that you just busted out a personal best and can't lift your arms for a week. Yeah. And you're here for the gold medal. Show up as the best of who you are. And there's so many people doing that that are crushing it right now because they're focusing on what they can control. They're asking better questions and they're not blaming into to me mode. They're not they are focusing on what they can't control and getting upset and feel paralyzed. And they're starting to recognize that, boom, we're in the gym right now. Time to shine. My, my gosh, man. Like I feel like our, our lexicon of the world is so aligned. I'm, I'm having so much fun listening to you speak right now. Uh, the gym metaphors, uh, it's just, it, you know, our number one core value in my business is we eagerly do hard things well. And that's, you know, I teach entrepreneurial education. Like I'm, I deliver training, coaching and experiences for developing entrepreneurs. But like the starting point isn't just that we do hard things. 
it's not even just that we do hard things really well. It's that we eagerly do hard things well, which means we endure the hard, we do them enough to get good at them, and we're really excited about it every step of the way. And without, I think, you know, you obviously, you're living proof of that. You get that. You could say that back to me in your own words. But you're right, man. It is such a foreign concept for most people. I love that you said we don't live in a comfort centric world. We live in a growth centric world. I mean, you look at Tony's core needs of personality. The two spiritual ones are growth, contribution, contribution right? Growth is about consuming and converting into self. Contribution is about taking from self and projecting out to others. Stasis is the opposite of both of those. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're going to fall down. If, you, if you're chasing comfort, then I got news for you. Life is a pretty ruthless personal trainer if you're not listening. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and if you'll permit me, I know we're kind of tight on time here as well, but I'd love to share one last example with the, the, the audience because I, I want to prove that this is real and what's possible. And so, you know, just because you and I, yeah, people think we've got our you know, uh, uh, spiritually harmonizing intelligent truth together, S-H-I-T, <laughs> yeah, uh, then, yeah, to quote uh, my, my friend John Martini on that, uh, then I, they think that we get it easy. We don't because yeah, if you're, you're in grade seven and you pass grade seven, guess what? You go to grade eight. Yeah, are the questions harder? Yes, they're meant to be. So we are going to get tested because I believe we're in earth school. And I had a, an example of this, what I call a graduation event. Because if you really want to understand how life works, understand this. Theory does not cover the price of admission to the higher levels of grades. Mm. Right? And so three years ago, I was arguing a business deal in court, multi-million dollar deal uh, with a, a major, large, multinational, multi-billion dollar firm that you know, I probably won't name you know, as, as Hewlett Packard. And yeah, it kind of, basically they were suing me for 17 million on a $12 million deal that we'd done. And it was, it was all fabricated, what in my mind, bullying because they could afford better lawyers. And I wasn't playing. I'm like, no, this is just out of order. It's out of integrity. And yeah, what you're trying to do is wrong. Yeah, you're trying to muscle a, a, a little guy to squeeze more juice out of the deal, uh, thinking I settle on some ridiculously, you know, token right. effort, which is what they're trying to do. Anyway, we went to court, civil action. They filed a contempt of court application, which I thought was a chess move. You know, one of my other long-term 25-year uh, mentors, Dan Pena, you know, the, uh, the trillion-dollar man mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, I, I unleashed on the world when I introduced him to Brian Rose, by the way. Right. Uh, uh, but... Uh, he told, told me many years ago that litigation in business is nothing but a tool. It's a chess move. Anyway, I, I didn't give it as much credibility. My ego was still you know, quite high against the indignation of what I thought they were doing. They sold it to the judge, gave me six months in jail as the only non-criminal. Never been arrested, never been accused of a crime, still don't have a criminal record. And I spent six months as a civil prisoner in the most violent prison in the UK. I got 53 staff at the time doing six figures a month in revenue on one business. And, and, and basically, I went from 53 to three staff in three days. I mean, lost everything. They hit me with hundreds of thousands in legal debt. And yeah, basically threw me in the slammer in a jail where three deaths in one week was the worst week I was there. Yeah, attempted murders every week, blood on the floor daily. And when it looked like it was going south, and this is three years ago, I turned around to my, my then girl and she says, well, why is this happening? I'm like, listen, honey, I don't know, but. Yeah, you can't control what you can't control. I says, here's the deal. I've been very blessed that over the last 25 years, millions of people around the world have benefited from my, yeah, benefited from my work. Yeah, whether it's my yeah, podcasts or my yeah, um, YouTubes or yeah, my, my talks, my work, my, my lectures, my coaching. I said, but maybe the real people that need that never get to see it because they're in somewhere like jail. So if the universe or whatever you want to call it is, wants to send me in to go hold a light, let me go do it. And I never went in, I talked about identity earlier, Jeff. I never went in uh, with the identity of a prisoner. That would have been put me in to me mode. I went in with the identity of a secret agent of change. And to cut a long story short, I ended up getting a lot of the prisoners off drugs, I was stopping suicides, I redesigned the intake system to reduce violence. It's now being rolled out across prisons all over the world. I won a national award for the work I was doing while I was in there. And I, I turned around at the end and thought, that, that, yeah, I, I, every two weeks I wrote to my senior coaching clients, essentially, teaching them what I was doing and showing them in real time all of the tradecraft, all the high-level stuff in an environment that you know, wasn't theory. 
and nobody knew what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew why I was there to focus on contributing and grow out of the experience. And when I came out, they said they'd learned more from the 11 letters that I'd written than following me around the world for the last two years on stage. And I'd had to share them. I'm like, well, these are private letters. That, that, that was, uh, this was never meant to be a book, right? right? Yeah, this is private stuff. But some people pay me 50 grand a year to, to learn. All right, I'm like, yeah, but like, no, it'll help a lot of people. That's my hot button. So we published the letters, just the 11 letters that I wrote and called The Inside Track. It went bestseller in two hours. That was the number one in four hours. We sold to, yeah, I've sold out four suppliers on the first day, sold to 40 countries on the first day. And it's, it's changed the life of everybody that's read the book. And you look back at that and think, there was definitely a higher level reason for me going through that and turned into one of the greatest adventures I've ever had the privilege of living. Wow. You know, I saw on your bio that you had spent six months in jail and I just assume, I mean, shame on me. You know what happened, what they say about assuming. I just assumed that was when you were like 20 and you got, you know, shoplifted a pack of gum or something. Like I, I had no idea that was such a visceral part of your present experience. And I obviously didn't know that tied to the book. I mean, I don't have to be the one to tell you because I'm sure I'm just an echo at this point. That's a ridiculously powerful story. Uh, like uh, mind um, blown dude i have nothing to say i'm just like holy shit <laughs> it's uh, i sometimes look back and, and reread the letters uh because i wrote them all by hand yeah obviously i mean what you can see behind me it's, it's, it's called the inside yeah. track you can see the cover on there as well <laughs> yeah. now, and now the uh, cover makes sense for sure for yeah, those of you that are listening on audio it's got bars in front of his face yeah. how do people get the book i mean let's let's uh, get right I, to that it, you go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and spend twenty four ninety five. Or right now, because I mean, the tagline of this couldn't have been better for twenty twenty. It's called an inspirational guide to conquering adversity. Yeah, and it's a how to manual for turning your greatest challenges into your greatest successes. And uh, I just wanted to get it into as many hands as possible. So I'm, I'm virtually I'm giving it away for for nine bucks if you cover the shipping. All right, and, and trust me, it cost me eleven bucks to print and ship. So I lose right. two bucks. So I'm going to do it for a limited time. But yeah, I, I don't get Pete'sBook.com. I made it easy for people to remember, and yeah, and they can go get their own copy. It's also on Audible. Uh, I read the words myself. I wanted you to get the emotion of the reality of what was going on. Uh, we work with a top sound engineer. It's uh, there's a musical score with it, which we created. The sound effects. It's quite the Audible journey. But yeah, it's. It, I, I look back and sometimes I think, did that really happen? <laughs> Crazy man. And, and you read at the back of the book that the letters, not just from, because you can write anything, but the letters from not just the prisoners, but the prison officers, the guards, the senior officers, and the governors of the prison on the difference and the, the impact. It created a movement. And yeah, I say very privileged that it's now being rolled out. You know, a lot of the stuff that I did in, in prisons all over the world and translated into several languages. And yeah, I, 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 some people are calling it my, my residential book writing holiday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 I was in jail. <laughs> yeah, get get, uh, yeah. get Pete'sBook.com. Yeah, get Pete'sBook.com, and uh, and I, I'll give it you for nine bucks. Uh, and I can't, I can't say fairer than that. If if you uh, to, yeah. to help you with where you're at, that's amazing. I'll be I'll be ordering the uh, the audio book like as soon as we're done with this conversation. That that's uh, that's beautiful. Get Pete'sBook.com. How else can people? Uh, get into your world. Do you do social media? Like, what's your preferred way? For yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you can follow me on I'm on Instagram, Peter Sage 007. Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, you, my YouTube channel. I'm always putting out as much content because some people, yeah, you know, they're, they're happy to pay for premium stuff, but there's a lot of people that are still trying to bootstrap. Yeah. So, like you, Jeff, we're, we're, we're both, I know, keen at putting out stuff that for the masses that you know, can help them get on the first or second step so they can reach up to grab a higher rung. And we're committed to doing that. So yeah, you can find me pretty much everywhere. My website, petersage.com. Um, oh, the book's also being made into a movie. We've signed a movie deal for that for one of the, the top uh, award-winning film production companies as well. That's happening next year. So yeah, who, who'd have thought, hey? And, and I just uh, I just finished paying off two weeks ago. I finished paying off. I came out with nothing, third of a million in debt. And I just finished, yeah, I, 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 uh, not only giving everybody the first priority when I came out was to give everybody that bought tickets to my seminars that got canceled or anything, the product or round the world trips that I did for my high level coaching. It took me a year to, to fulfill every one of those. And we gave two refunds out of 150 people. Wow. And, uh, and then I, I said, I'm going to move to the Channel Islands where I'm based now. I showed up with one month's rent in my, my bank uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and uh, again, by that time, probably a quarter of a million in debt. And we've just cleared everything this year. And we're going to finish the year with the best financial year I've ever had. So you showed up, correction though, you showed up with two months rent and that toolbox. 
Oh, absolutely. That they can't take away from you. And that's why you've been able to bounce back again. I mean, it's part of what we do. And that's yeah, the certainty. You know, people are like to, to tie it all up. People are so concerned right now about the cracks that are showing in their quote certainty. Well, ain't nobody having bigger cracks right now than getting tossed in the clink for six months and having to come out a quarter million dollars in debt and lose their whole or a third of a million in debt, lose their whole business, start over from scratch. But with the toolbox and the understanding of what real certainty is, look at you, man, you're back on top. That's, you know, I, as I said, I, to, to be the invitation, you have to be the example. If I couldn't walk my talk inside, let alone coming out, I shouldn't be doing what I do. Wow, man. Well, I want to say that I'm, I will say I'm simultaneously sorry and grateful that you were tested to that extreme because that's a pretty intense one. But I mean, just, I, I just got to say, you know, I'm inspired. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Peter, I know, I know we both have other, other pressing things and we're, we're technically over what we blocked out for this show, but I'm so grateful for it, man. This has been amazing. Um, you said Peter Sage 007 on Instagram. Obviously, we'll get all the relevant links and put them in the description. Any parting thoughts before we tie this up? If I've done anything today with you know, how grateful I am for you being able to give me the platform to share on, on your channel here, Jeff, if, if, if there's anything I've been able to, to you know, part, it, it would be really the message that you know we're not fragile. You have the ability to do anything that you want. Right? When you turn around and make a committed decision to swing in the bat and playing the game of life, not fighting the game of life, honestly, a new future is always available. And I hope they take that on and, and anything I can do to support them, I'm happy to. Amen, man. We couldn't end on a finer note. Um, I just want to say thanks again for joining us on Millionaire Secrets. Thank you to the entire tribe out there uh, for listening or watching, depending where you are. Make sure to follow Peter uh, for more of his insights and, and, and greatness and definitely get that book. I'm going to be getting that book right away. If you have not subscribed to either the channel or the podcast, I ask you to do so so you get notified of future episodes and make sure to grab a copy of our free book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which teaches you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new digital economy at millionairesecrets.com forward slash Peter S. So we'll know that you uh, came there from this episode and thank you again to all of you out there that are striving for greatness. You are the reason I do what I do. And people like Peter, you inspire me every day, man. Thank you so much for being a guest. My pleasure. Keep doing what you're doing, Jeff. You're a gift to the world, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.